In the 1950s, when there were still many local cinemas, there was an extensive need for action films. Those action films, also called B pictures, were produced for very little money and a tight schedule, and they presented one or two familiar faces in the lead roles. The audience didn't notice who directed these pictures. Nobody cared for their names, but some outstanding pictures were made and proved that lack of money was no obstacle in creating a fine piece of art. The king of the B pictures who graduated to big budget productions was Donald Siegel, and he made films with illustrious titles like No Time for Flowers, The Lineup, The Gun Runners, and Crime in the Streets. Those were not only cheap program fillers for Saturday night audiences who didn't even know the title of the pictures they were seeing, sometimes they were interesting subjects covered in genre films like westerns, thrillers, or adventure movies. This documentary is about the king of B-movies, who, as Peter Bogdanovich once said, has managed, often against stifling odds, to bring out a disquiet ambiguity as well as unified viewpoint to assignments which, in other hands, could easily have been routine. It's marked by a vigorous gift for visual storytelling. your house? And uh, well, it's, uh, I'd hardly say it's my house. The Bank of America owns most of it, but, but I'm living uh, uh, overlooking uh, San Fernando Valley, and right down below there is Benedict Canyon. Uh, it's not uh, really uh, Hollywood. There's an old tree down there that's uh, 800 years old, an oak tree, and I like it. It, it, uh, it is dangerous living here. Of course, uh, uh, when it rains, it's, uh, all those hills start sliding full of mud. And when fire comes, you, you flee because it's very dangerous uh, in the valley in the summer, particularly when it gets dry. However, I like it. And it's uh, a fun life for me. Uh, over here is uh, oh, Clint Eastwood guarding uh, my office uh, with his 44 Magnum. He was playing Dirty Harry there, and there's uh, a uh, retrospective in Vienna on uh, most of the films that I had done. This is the place where you work, basically. Pardon? This is the place where you work. Oh, yes. This is uh, my office. I generally, of course, have an office uh, uh, at whatever studio I'm working. But uh, I like it here. And you do exercises over there? Yes, I, in the morning, uh, cycle a bit. And uh, I, uh, we get over there, I'll show you a bar. In fact, I'll hang on that bar when we get over there. 
But uh, uh, here's a uh, an obscene uh, uh, chess set that I used in uh, Rough Cut. It was in uh, Burt Reynolds' uh, penthouse. And here's the chair that I uh, worked from. Uh, I wish I could learn to be a proper director and uh, really sit down when I work, but I always have to stand up. I uh, generally go in here and uh, when I get bored and try to crack my back a bit, you know, hang here a little bit. It, is, it doesn't matter what picture I'm directing. I'm not having fun. I find directing very dull and boring. It, it's totally consuming of your time. Uh, you have to be where the action is. It's much easier to sit down and write about climbing uh, the Eiger Mountain in bitter cold and then sliding all the way down and, and then going 10 fathoms under the sea and then crawling across the burning desert. But as the director, I've got to be climbing the mountain. I've got to slide down the mountain. I've got to go 10 fathoms under the sea. I've got to climb uh, or crawl across the hot burning desert. And I don't enjoy directing. I really don't. I, 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 I don't know where I am. They pick me up, at, it's dark in the morning. They take me to the location and they bring me back. It's dark and people say, how do you like working in London? Wh where am I, am I in London? Oh, fine, good. It's, it, it, I, and I don't do anything but work. Uh, like, uh, I work constantly on the script, I'm uh, looking for locations, I'm quarreling with the producer. Uh, if I'm not quarreling with the actor, fortunately, in this picture, uh, this last picture, I, I, I got along very well with the actors. But um, uh, there's a, the, the, those of you who are not directors think it's a very romantic job. Uh, to me, it isn't. It's a lot of hard work. Let him go in. Let him go in. That's what I'm saying before shooting the rehearsal. Frequently, something happens, the car falls down, goes into the car, you got a great shot. Obviously, the best way to um, get into uh, making pictures is to uh, have a, some relative in the top echelon at the studio, and then you start from the top and gradually work your way down. Unfortunately, I started from the bottom, carrying cans of film. But when I got into Los Angeles, I called my uncle, Jack Saper, who was uh, a very close friend of Hal Wallace. And uh, I ran into what all young people run into when they go to get a job. Hal Wallace saw me, uh, he talked just as though he were talking today, he was saying that the, they have all the people they need, uh, and in fact they were even thinking of closing the studio down, and anyway, uh, what experience did I have? And I said, I have exactly as much experience as you had when you first started, none. And I guess my brass manner intrigued him. So he got me a job in the film library, which I thought were books on film, in a library, you know. Uh, to my dismay, I discovered it was um, film. And the first job I had, I had to cut sunrises. And I couldn't tell when the, I couldn't tell whether they were sunrise or sunsets by the time I finished them. I had them upside down. And uh, that was the start of my career. But did, at that moment, were you already thinking, I want to be a movie director or no, just no, working I in a studio? No, I did at all. As a matter of fact, the chap that was head of the film library uh, 
was uh, noted for several things. One, he was a great badminton player, and he was intrigued by the fact that, you know, I was a table tennis champion. And he also was a very heavy drinker, uh, which is kind of a good combination, because when we'd go out, get drunk the night before, then we'd go into the room, projection room, to look at the film that could be used as stock. And we slept most of the day. And as far as I was concerned, it was the best job in the world. It was my first job, but it was also the best job because I had nothing to do, I mean, but sleep during the day and drink during the night. But this chap, uh, De Leon Anthony, uh, felt guilty about the fact that he was ruining me in that, uh, you know, he felt that I had... Uh, a certain promise, and uh, so he uh, really kicked me out into the cutting department. I became an assistant cutter. Otherwise, I'd have still been in the library, and I'd have been much happier than I am now. Okay. In 1946, Don Siegel directs his first feature film, The Verdict. Since 1934, he has edited many pictures, directed Second Unit, and has made two short pictures that won Academy Awards, Star in the Night and Hitler Lives. Although it's very difficult to get a job as a director, he continues to make small pictures for big producers and studios. Maybe the kids from Crime in the Street saw a Siegel movie in their neighborhood cinema house. What I tried to do, and I still do, is uh, I tried to do the best job I could. Uh, for instance, uh, Babyface Nelson. It's a terrible script. And I got uh, a very dear friend of mine, Danny Manwaring, who's written a number of pictures, uh, had written a number of pictures for me, and, and he wrote that script in two weeks, and it had a, uh, a vitality and a uh, drive that uh, way ahead of its time. And we had uh, Babyface Nelson in uh, Mickey Rooney, who of course is a you know superb actor. Uh, but it was a question, in to state your question uh, of getting the assignment and having uh, two weeks to prepare and uh, doing it, that's all. I, I, I certainly couldn't do it now. But did you, uh, did you get depressed by doing those movies? Because you must have felt that you could do better than just doing a job that you would like to do. I was really more depressed uh, with uh, being told uh, on the 17th day of shooting that that was the last day. Apparently they'd run out of money or something. And uh, uh, I told Mickey Rooney that they were going to ruin the picture. And then I heard later that he said, look, if he doesn't want to do it, I'll do it, which I thought was charming of Mickey. Uh, but, but typical of his being Babyface Nelson. The picture turned out well. Not cut well. Uh, because, uh, I don't know, I left to do another picture and I, I had uh, done a little cutting on it, but not what I have done on all my pictures. I remember that picture particularly was uh, influenced very heavily by the uh, producer. Uh, incidentally, the, the picture takes place in the early 30s. I lost the producer because he couldn't understand why I wouldn't use 1940 cars. You know? He said, couldn't see any reason. Well, what difference does it make? You know? Well, it made a lot of difference to me. But uh, that was the end of my pleasant relationship with the producer. How possible that you always get another job if you have so many fights? I don't know. I, it seemed to me that uh, uh, I would run out of producers, or certainly run out of studios. But uh, they're very greedy, 
And if you do do a, a job that they think is uh, reasonably good, even though they hate you, they, 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 they want you to do that film. I guess we haven't any choice. Well, you did a lot of uh, B movies in the, in the 50s. I don't uh, or ha make the same face that you make when you say you did a lot of B movies. Uh, I think that I showed as uh, much skill doing B movies mm -hmm. as I've done in any uh, so-called A movies. Yeah. I don't think it really matters uh, how large the picture is. I think the big difference between American movies and uh, European movies is that in American movies, they're more interested in who's in the picture and how much money you spent. Whereas it seems to me in European movies, particularly the French movies, uh, they're interested in the content of the story. And I think their way is better than that. So that means that you actually felt, maybe not at that time, that you were in the wrong country making movies. I was unaware of it, because I didn't know I was being successful in Europe. Totally didn't know. I didn't know anything about the cult, Siegel cult. No idea at all. I never had a publicity agent. And it just came accidentally really into life when I did uh, Invasion of the Body Snatchers, which was not a success here. And then all of a sudden it kind of became uh, uh, a um, undercover picture, you know. And, uh, and I suddenly found that I was famous. And I really, uh, when I made the picture, I, I had my usual trouble with the uh, studio. I, I felt that they were, I don't know whether you know the picture well, uh, or the people who are looking at this will know it at all, but it's about pods and uh, who uh, take over the bodies of, uh, of uh, people and they have no uh, cultural aspirations and they have no feeling of love. And I felt that the pods re really were the people that were running the studio. Uh, not, not Walter Wanger, who was the producer. He was anything but a pod. I don't uh, ever uh, look down at my nose and make pi pictures for children. And I don't make pictures for uh, for Jews. And I don't make pictures for the moguls, the front office. I make pictures only for one person, myself. Now, when that day comes that uh, my pictures are not successful, then I'll get out of the business. Fine outside here, rehearsal. All right, action! What's this supposed to be? This is an airport, uh, whatever it is, vehicle. Security, Security vehicle. That's what you're going to drive to get us on the airport. How did it get here? Nigel runs it. Handyman. Yeah, smart man, too. We botch this thing up, he still comes out alive. See, you start getting sticky from now on, so... If you want out, now's the time to say so. What do you mean, out? Out of this or out of your life? Tell me. How much is my share? Charming. What have we done here? Well, sir, if you could be yeah. a little to your left at that stage, you, mean, you lean on. Just you bet. Not as much as that. It's, it's not there. I'm That's not going to move there. I moved too early. How much is my share? Yeah, you did. Uh, uh charming. Yeah, let's right. go back and wait for us. All right. Okay. okay, here we go. Ready? How much is my share? Oh, <clears throat> charming. Right to the end. Listen, I don't know what's going to happen. You haven't told me anything. I never tell. Siegel's heroes are most of the time persons in conflict with their surroundings. They can be psychotic. But in Flaming Star, a picture about racial differences, Elvis Presley as a half-breed is even tragic. There must have been something wrong with the picture. 
because it was written originally for Marlon Brando. Now, how uh, Elvis Presley gets it is, you know, it makes no sense. And I also wouldn't allow him to sing in the picture, which uh, created a lot of enmity with uh, Colonel Parker and uh, certain executives at, uh, at uh, 20th Century Fox, because I thought it was wrong that he be uh, uh, singing because he's Elvis Presley. I wanted him to be the character, uh, the half-breed, uh, not because he's Elvis Presley. I don't know what the picture would have turned out if we'd gotten Marlon Brando, who should have really played the part. I thought uh, Elvis was quite good in the picture. He was scared to death of it. But uh, I liked him. How did you make him feel comfortable? Well, I became kind of a father image to him. And uh, he had... Uh, he didn't want to play the scene where he loses his temper and goes after his brother. And so he said, look, if you push it back, I'll let you drive my Rolls Royce. So <laughs> that was great with me. I pushed it back and pushed it back and pushed it back, and finally I, I had to shoot the scene, and then I lost the Rolls Royce. And one time he broke down, because uh, he was so nervous about the scene. and I, you know, I tried to make him feel as comfortable as possible. And I remember another incident with him in that picture. He, he was always breaking uh, uh, wood into kindling wood. You know, he'd hit it with his fingers like that, karate and elbow and his toe and all that. But then I'd go home with a lot of kindling wood. And so one day I said to my uh, prop man, why don't you come by? with a piece of balsa wood, and I'll catch it out of the corner of my eye whenever you see that I'm talking to, to Elvis. And so he did this, and as I see him coming, I said to Elvis, I know you, you really are a pain, you know, breaking wood as though it means anything. And as this thing came by, I went boom, and I broke it into a thousand bits. And Elvis put his arm around me, he said, yeah, yeah, that's quite interesting. He said, my last director did exactly that same thing, <laughs> hit balsa wood. <laughs> In 1964, Don Siegel works for television, which seems for him the end of the line. But the two pictures he directs, The Hangman and The Killers, are released in cinemas. Well, I came up with an idea of telling it from the killer's point of view, so that it wasn't a Xerox copy of the original Killers. And I didn't use any of... Uh, Mark of um, Hemingway's uh, marvelous short story. And I, I just, uh, the only thing I stole was the catalyst that a man knows he's going to be killed and doesn't run away. But they couldn't release it on TV, so then it lamely went out as a feature. Why couldn't they release it on TV? Because it was too rough, it was too tough. That was about the time Kennedy was assassinated, yeah, that's and right. they were afraid and of it. They, they just couldn't do it. And they tried to get me to uh, recut it, and then I just quit. You know, I just couldn't recut it. There's a couple of gentlemen to see you, Mr. Palmer. Now, what's the matter? I can't wait. You will tell us everything. You open up the picture, and there's uh, uh, Lee Marvin, who kills John Cassavetes, and then uh, punches out a woman. Now, what else does he have to do? From then on, you don't have to do anything uh, as far as violence is concerned. Because the moment he walks into a scene, you're thinking, whoops. And you don't really do as much violence as the next uh, director would do. Hi, boy. You and I are just both communicating. My pictures are not anywhere near as violent. And this is not Sam Peckinpah talking. Uh, as you might think, they're, they're, they're looming over the scene, liable to be exploding at any minute. And when they do explode, it's very quick. 
uh, unlike uh, Peckinpah's slow motion. And I'm, because of the way the violence takes place, you are aware of the fact, like in The Killers with uh, Lee Marvin and Clue Gulliver, that uh, you don't have to say anything. Because, and you don't have to, you just imply it that it's going to take place, and the audience is on edge. So there isn't really uh, what you normally call a great deal of action in my films. It's impending disaster. Well, in Dirty Harry, it doesn't mean that I condone uh, hard-nosed cops by showing them as uh, realistically as possible. Now, all this maybe didn't get over. Maybe I was the only one in the world that, that uh, was aware of that, other than the actors, of course. But um, stuff like Dirty Hair, which I'm not in all running down, because I think that I like the picture. Nevertheless, Dirty Harry is condemned by many people for being too violent. Maybe it is in 1971, but in the years to come, worse pictures show more violence and are made by far less talented directors. How could you describe him as a director and as a person? Because you know him very well. <laughs> well, uh, you want that all in one minute? or uh, <laughs> the, uh, Well, I started working with Don in the late late 1960s. We did our first picture together, a film called Coogan's Bluff. Uh, I didn't know Don. Um, he was actually replacing another director who was uh, ill or for some reason had dropped out of this film project. And uh, so I went and looked at his films and kind of researched him. And he did the same with me, I guess. And uh, I, I liked him very uh, right away. I felt he was... Uh, he was a very interesting character right away, a very uh, seemingly kind of a gruff character on the surface, but underneath he was a, a, a sensitive man who had some, uh, had some good tastes and some good ideas in films. Uh, we weren't without arguments on that first film because we were going for, uh, neither one of us knew each other too well, but we, we ended up getting along famously. Uh, about, I guess about by the time the film was half over, we were, really working well in, in sync, and I feel that, uh, in fact, so much so that the very next film I did, well, not the very next film, but the two films afterwards, I, I asked for him again. Don uh, uh, was one of those guys who's done a lot with a little. Uh, and in this town, uh, I don't know how it is in other parts of the world, but in this particular town here, there there's a big habit of people uh, giving the credit to people who could spend the most and waste the most money. Don was always very efficient and, uh, and, and tight with schedules, forced to work that way because of, of the slot he had been put in. I think that through me, uh, uh, I mean, with, along with me, he got opportunities to do pictures on a little larger scale and did, did well with them. Would you say there is some sort of chemistry between the two of you when you work together because it comes off very well? I think so. I think that... Uh, I think he's been very good for me, and I've been very good for him. I think that that we uh, work well together. We, there's a lot of good give and take, and uh, he, he likes what I do, and I like what he does. I think there's a good mutual respect. Don Siegel and Clint Eastwood continue working together for four years, in which they make four pictures. Coogan's Bluff, Two Mules for Sister Sarah, the Beguiled and Dirty Harry. For Siegel, Clint becomes the ideal anti-hero, the anti-social outcast who doesn't understand society and who doesn't want to deal with it. Although Clint Eastwood makes a definite pattern for himself as an actor in the projects he chooses, The Beguiled seems to be a diversion. Also, for his favorite director, Don Siegel, who wants to break away from cops and robber stories. Uh, Beguiled was owned by Universal, so it wasn't too uh, hard to get it uh, started. It was on the shelf at that time. And uh, Don and I uh, liked it. I, I liked it, and I gave it to him to read. He liked it, and he... Uh, then we went back and read the book, and we liked the book also, and so we took... We incorporated uh, facets of the original book uh, in the picture. 
It was a very unusual project, a very unusual uh, uh, project for me to do, but we felt uh, that way about it. And we, felt, we told the studio when we made that picture that it was a very unusual picture and should be presented in a very unusual way. I mean, the advertisement would have to be equally as creative as anything done in the film, or even more so, for that matter. There literally was no action in it at all, and there I had the king of the action people, uh, Clint Eastwood, who, by the way, I thought was excellent in the picture. Uh, and that, that is a good lesson for people who make pictures. Uh, if the studio doesn't get behind your picture, you might just well not make it. They didn't understand the picture at all. So the picture was a colossal flop. If it had been released properly, we would have won the Cannes Film Festival, we would have won the Venice Film Festival, etc. Put it in a little theater and have people say, what is kind of a picture? Is this a Clint Eastwood picture that wins the festival? But they were too greedy. They wanted it all immediately, so they opened it up in Milano, which is the king of the spaghetti westerns. And... <laughs> <laughs> they couldn't believe what they were seeing. I mean, it, it never got off the ground, ever. I mean, it was just a, a dismal failure. Maybe we should explain a little bit what the picture is about, because it's, uh, it's well, a, in the Civil War. Yes, it takes place during the Civil War, and there's... Uh, uh, and it's down south, and there's uh, uh, girls it's, it's, uh, living in this big house. It's like a seminary, a school. And this wounded Union soldier Come on, you is uh, brought into the house by this young girl. And Clint Eastwood, a Union soldier in Southern Territory, is a beguiler. He beguiles everyone. And he's fending very welcome, so. And then he oversteps the bounds. No idea what you want. The thing that fascinated me about that picture was that the uh, young girls, full of innocence and uh, unwrinkled faces and uh, no makeup, etc., uh, were really wearing a mask. And when you pull that mask off them, they had as much evil in them as members of the Mafia. That, that, I like that, because I believe that. I think children are uh, capable of anything. Very dangerous, by the way. You know, like uh, when they play with uh, little uh, animals, they'll, 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 they'll torture them. Okay? Although they look very sweet and lovely and charming. You worked a lot with Don Siegel. I mean, a lot of that means four pictures. Four, ten, yeah. four pictures, which is kind of regular because no, nobody else does so many pictures with, with Don. He changed around only for Clint Eastwood, so you kind of regular. Yeah, I'm, I'm the old. Uh, <laughs> I thought maybe, maybe his film did well and, and that became an omen or something, you know. Yeah. I don't know. The first one was Madigan. Right, yeah. With. Um, you were. Richard Whitmark's uh, yes. old girlfriend? Yes, from right. Girlfriend, I'm... And you tried to get him back or something? Yeah, yeah, I'm always somebody's old girlfriend. <laughs> um, Richard Whitmark doesn't have too great a sense of humor, but Inger Stevens was in it. And um, everybody had a lot of laughs. It was, uh, I think she got the measles, and Don just loved that. He counted out how many people he could get her to kiss before they found out that she had the measles. But I guess after I left Fox, that was probably one of the more serious films I did was with Don. And I don't even know how that happened. I don't know how he hired me. Um, and then it was years later that I worked with Don again, and he said, you know, he said, I have wanted to use you. I have never forgotten you. And he said, this is the first time a film came up where there was a part for you again. Does Don tell you a lot when he directs the picture, what he wants of you, what he, how he sees the part, or is it a sort of feeling, is it a sort of no, understanding? No, um, with me, he just lets me do it. Um, and I'm, 
that ha- on most of the stuff I do, I do my homework. And my acting teacher said, give, give your director a break. He said, come in prepared, because they've got so many other things going, they'll be so relieved. And um, no, Don never does that. He, um, he just encourages you. If you're on the right track, he just encourages you to do that, you know. And he, what I think what Don does is he makes an atmosphere that's comfortable so that you can do your work. And um, sometimes you could prepare and, and feel that everything is right, but if the director doesn't make that comfortable atmosphere, you can't do your best work. And with Donald, he, uh, he, I think he just makes it comfortable for everyone. In the 1960s, the genre of action films in which Don Siegel works is now occupying the class movie houses. Actors like Lee Marvin, Charles Bronson, and Richard Widmark are no longer ordinary heavies, but the new heroes of the screen. And they all want to work with the man who can do the stuff that's hard to do, action. When you're doing the shoot this, you're working with some sort of institution. John Wayne is an institution. How do you feel about well, that? Well, I thought I was working with a living legend. And uh, I was uh, uh, bowled over by him and his warmth and, uh, and uh, wrapping his hand around mine twice and saying it's about time that we work together and we worked on the script at his house at Newport and everything was fine until the first day of shooting where he uh, ran amok. He told me I was strong as an ox. Or well, even an ox died. Uh, he was unmanageable and... Uh, very assertive and uh, very physical, very loud, very profane. So I decided that uh, the following morning I was going to go and see him and uh, tell him that uh, I can't work this way. I, when I freeze, I, I have to work loose. And uh, before I left my room, he asked me to come up to his suite and uh, he wanted to talk to me. And I said, well, that's fine with me because I want to talk to you. So I went to see him and, and the, his secretary was having uh, breakfast with uh, her girlfriend and uh, he screamed at them to uh, get out of the room. And then the uh, unfortunate makeup man knocked on the door and uh, he told him to that he didn't want to be made up. And the makeup man, who was a very good friend of his, said, look, we have to make you up here. And he opened the door and he threw a kick at him. So far, I haven't said anything yet. And then the wardrobe guy was in the next room kind of eavesdropping. And he uh, got him to, he went over and slammed the door, actually, in the guy's face. Then he turned around to me and he said, uh, I, I, I don't know what to say, Don. I don't know why I did this. I don't, I don't know. And I... Apologize, and he was just overcome. And I said, well, it really wasn't as bad as uh, uh, you might think. It was just that I can't work under those conditions. And uh, many of your ideas are very good. And he was really, uh, couldn't, uh, felt more uh, concerned that uh, we hadn't gotten along. Now, of course, I can't stand success, so I said, and although you are very knowledgeable, I've seen all the pictures that you've directed, and I never liked one of them, which should have ended our career right there, but, but he took it like a man. And now we go out on the set, and he's saying, uh, uh, Mr. Siegel, sir, uh, he couldn't have been more polite. And everybody's absolutely astounded. What happened? Because yesterday we were, you know, not getting along at all. Well, that lasted for about three days, and then so we went into uh, another uh, quarrel. I had turned down doing a film with John Wayne because he and I politically were very opposite ends of the pole, and so I didn't think he would want to work with me. And uh, at that point in John Wayne's life, he wasn't well. He'd been ill on the film. And I think he wanted to only work with people that he felt 
he knew and was comfortable with. And Don was insistent that I do that. And, uh, and it turned out very well because when I met with him, with John Wayne, he was like a, like a little pussycat, you know. He held my hands and he was just uh, not like anything that you would think, you know. He always smelled of peanut butter. He's always eating peanut butter and crackers. And, and uh, but I don't. I Don had to really convince him uh, to let me work with him uh, at that point. Do you know how he convinced him? Did no, I don't. Him? I never knew about that. But I think that he had to be quite persuasive. And um, I don't think it was always that easy between Donald and John Wayne either. Um, I think there was some. I won't go into that. And I loved you once. After eight years, Don Siegel and Clint Eastwood reunite for the real-life story of Frank Morris, who supposedly escaped from Alcatraz. Your, your latest films, for instance, The Shootist and Escape from Alcatraz, almost come close to documentary, because The Shootist is about John Wayne, mm. and Escape from Alcatraz, obviously, especially with the photography, which is fantastic in blue and, and almost black and white. You, mm. you know, it, it comes close to documentary. It's very stylized, very documentary-like. Well, it's realistic, uh, but I uh, find it a little difficult to uh, compare the two pictures. Uh, one picture had uh, heart, uh, certainly uh, Sherry North was superb in it. Uh, but I had tears in my eyes. I never seen my pictures, and when I was in England, they ran it for me at the British Film Academy with an audience. I never seen it with an audience. And I really had tears in my eyes uh, at the end of the picture. Because uh, I guess by then I'd forgotten about it. I haven't still seen Alcatraz with an audience. I ran the answer print just before I went to, uh, to England. And there were just the two of us in the projection room. And I said, well, I sort of like it. And no one has ever escaped from Alcatraz. And no one ever will. Life at 67 should be pleasant if you're a successful director. But on Rough Cut, a story about a jewel thief played by Burt Reynolds, a beautiful young lady, Leslie Ann Down, and a crooked Scotland Yard inspector, David Niven, things do not work out that well. The fights between director and producer never seem to end. Hardly a nice and comfortable atmosphere to do a comedy thriller. Don's kind of realistic sense of the street and people and, uh, and uh, smells and feel of real life are what I think has made him a, a, a real cult director. You go to school when you watch a Don Siegel film. I know directors, for example, Alan Bakul, who's a very respected director, looks at Alcatraz and goes to school. I've wanted to work with Don for a long time, and Clint Eastwood is my, my best friend. And uh, he's, been, he's been hiding him from me for years, and I couldn't get to him. And now that uh, Clint has gone off on his own and uh, is doing films on his own, uh, it just worked out that way, that he was free. And 
Clint, Clint has been telling me for a couple of years, you two guys would really get along great together, and uh, it sort of worked out that way. Yeah. We've known each other for 20 years. We were both fired at the same time at Universal Studio. He was fired because he has his, they told him his Adam's apple stuck out too far, and he had a chip on his tooth, and he talked too slow. I was fired because I couldn't act. I told Clint I could learn how to act, but he could never get his Adam's apple fixed. Uh, we both have done fairly well since then. Do you need anything else? Like making people disappear, either temporarily or permanently? I can do both tricks. You do that a lot, I bet. <laughs> I like it. So, what do you think? I think I don't like you. I've only known you a few minutes, but already I don't like you for years. Let's go. You came here to insult me. No, it just worked out that way. Move. Or what? Come on, let's go. Or what, eh? See, it wouldn't do for me to have a fight in a whorehouse window. Oh, okay, hold it. A barking her? Yeah. Instead of uh, you uh, coming forward to him, you come forward to him a little bit when you're going to do this. You see? Yeah. That keep, leaves it open. Here. Oh, what'll help is if, is when Wolf pushes me back, I won't come back. That's exactly what I mean. Uh, yeah. 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 Try that. Yeah. Um, uh, I, I just, no, it just worked out that way. Move. Well, I made it under considerable difficulties, but I made it as I thought it should be made. Naturally, there were severe limitations in some areas, but uh, that's what I made, that's all. Now, if it goes out and bombs, then, then it, to a certain extent, it's my fault. If it goes out and is a big success, then it's all my doing. Yeah. I mean, I look at it that yeah. way. But you're, you're a very successful director now. You were fired. After when? Well, that isn't being successful. No. Fired. That's the first time I was ever fired in my right. life. But you, you were fired at the moment when Els Escape from Alcatraz was grossing $30 million in the United States after two weeks. It uh, seems like a very strange moment to be fired. Well, he's a very strange producer. I mean, uh, there was no reason to, um, to fire me, and uh, I, was, uh, I didn't realize it, but the, uh, there was another director... Uh, who was on the picture three weeks before I knew that he was on it. He didn't work. He was just uh, running my film and looking at the sets and looking at the locations and made a trip to Amsterdam. That's a, a charmer by the name of uh, Peter Hunt. And uh, I think he possibly has... Uh, one day's work that I found usable. What's the reward? I guess occasionally, uh, and very occasionally, you turn out a picture that's uh, given a lot of enjoyment to people and there's uh, a reward which is a pretty obvious one. You make a lot of money. Uh, if I'm lucky, I'd like to live by my tenant uh, that uh, first I'd like to have fun on a picture, and second I'd like to do the best picture I could do, and if I don't do that, I won't have fun, and third, I'd like to make all the money I can make. That's, that's my credo. Uh, you certainly can get much better expressions from other directors uh, who uh, will approach it in a very artsy-crutsy fashion and to be much more meaningful about it. To me, it's an assignment, sometimes hopeless assignment, extremely difficult. But once in a great while, um, you'll have something that has something to say. And uh, like, you know, Invasion of the Body Snatchers, for example. But most of the time, my pictures are about nothing. Uh, you read into them a great deal that I don't read into them. I always try to do uh, the best work I can do. Uh, 
and, and there is a certain satisfaction in, in being a professional. I guess that's what I really am, is that I'm professional. They picked me because I was small and wiry. They didn't know that I wasn't finished. <laughs> oh, dirty. But, uh, that was all right. All right. Oh. Now, I want to say that I think the weather in Colin is very interesting. It is, yeah. Yeah, and I just hope it continues to rain because it makes it difficult when it doesn't rain, it rains, it doesn't rain, it rains, it doesn't rain. So this is gonna rain all day now, right? You notice 